Welcome to Forest North, a podcast from the Superior National Forest. I'm Brett Ross. Along with personnel from the United States Forest Service, we'll share news, information, and stories with the people who live, work, and recreate on our national forest lands here in the North Woods. On this premiere episode, I'm joined by Superior National Forest Supervisor Tom Hall, who will share some of what goes into managing nearly 4 million acres of woods and waters. We'll also preview Go Live Day for Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness Permits, coming up on January 31st. And Steve Robertson, Interpretation and Education Specialist, will talk about what some of the critters are up to on the National Forest in January. Forest North is created by the Ely Tourism Bureau in partnership with the USDA Forest Service, Superior National Forest. Find out more information about the Superior National Forest online at fs.usda.gov superior. Remember to like, follow, subscribe, leave a five-star review on whatever platform you're listening from, and email your questions or feedback to tourism at ely.org. This is Forest North. Welcome to our very first episode of the Forest North podcast. I am joined this episode by Superior National Forest Supervisor, Tom Hall. Tom, welcome. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Well, thanks so much for being here. It's a pleasure and uh, you're joining us on our very first episode of Forest North. And uh, if you could, just to start things off, give us a little bit of your background Yeah, this is exciting. Uh, I'm glad that we've entered into this uh, uh, journey of a podcast together. Um, So my career, what led me here to the Superior National Forest, uh, being the forest supervisor here, I actually kind of grew up in the Forest Service. I grew up in South Central Colorado, um, really on the Rio Grande National Forest. Uh, My dad worked for the forest uh, for a large part of my childhood. And so it was kind of a little predestined that I might come into the Forest Service. Uh, I started right out of high school as a temporary employee working in rain, spraying noxious weeds, and then uh, started to participate in fire a little bit, decided, hey, I want to explore other things, went into recreation and uh, packed stock up into the wilderness uh, on the Rio Grande National Forest uh, into the Sangre de Cristo uh, wilderness on the east side and the San Juans on the west side, uh, the Winnemanooch wilderness. So really connected into the Forest Service culture, uh, started to participate with uh, fire and be a firefighter on militia crews and go and fight fire out west, whether it was local there in Colorado, uh, went to Washington, other things like that. And uh what we call in the Forest Service, I kind of got the fire bug. You start to get that adrenaline rush um, and that connection to how fire works in that landscape, uh, that connection to crews and other things. And so I I actually moved into uh, what we call fuels management. And so uh, I ran a, a chainsaw for a couple summers and decided that I really wanted to go back to school. Um, and so I went to Colorado State uh, University and got a forestry degree with a fire science concentration. Um, and f- with that, starting to look for permanent jobs with the Forest Service, the, the job market was kind of tight. And so I uh, got an offer to go to grad school and uh, built an optimization model for fire suppression resources allocation on large fire Uh, incidents. And so that helped me to actually uh, qualify for a hiring authority within the Forest Service, uh, which is called the Presidential Management Fellowship. Um, And once I graduated with my master's degree, I competed for jobs to become a finalist as what we call a PMF, a Presidential Management Fellow, uh, and got a job in Southern California as a planner um, under what we call the National Environmental Policy Act, or NEPA. Um, I was a NEPA planner in Southern California. And um, Southern California, the San Bernardino National Forest, a very urban forest, very different than what I'm used to, uh, really what we're used to here in northern Minnesota, uh, but what I was used to in South Central Colorado. And so um, sort of expanded my scope, um, understood a different perspective of high use uh, impacts on public lands, um, how that impacts uh, 
public access and special uses in fire, um, fire suppression or fire management and what those risks, risks are to communities and really started to expand my scope of of thinking of maybe I wanted to be a leader within the agency. And so that started to me down the path of, of wanting to be a district ranger initially. And then ultimately the dream job is what I have now as the forest supervisor. Uh, so from the San, San Bernardino, I moved to Northern California on the Shasta Trinity National Forest. And I was a district ranger for six years in Northern California. And in order to reach the dream job of a forest supervisor, um, I, I actually moved to Washington, D.C. and worked in legislative affairs, which is really that interface between uh, the Forest Service as a USDA agency uh, and Congress mm -hmm. of um, what are our appropriations? How do we uh, have the authorities uh, to do the work that we do as an agency? And so great perspective building uh, and scope of understanding what what it is that we do at a higher level in order to perform better in now as the forest supervisor. So I've been here since uh, September of 2022. So a okay. little over a year now. All right. Well, I don't think we could have chosen anyone better to uh, join us for our first episode here because you, uh, it sounds like you have a deep immersion in, uh, in most aspects of the U.S. Forest Service. I've done a, a lot of things <laughs> over my 20 years with the agency. Yeah, that's fantastic. So let's zoom in a little bit now and talk specifically about the Superior National Forest, what your role is as forest supervisor, and a kind of an overview of the Superior National Forest and what the management role is for, uh, for the Forest Service. Yeah, so I might flip that a little bit, um, and it's almost a little easier to understand the structure that I work within to understand the job that I have. And so, like I said, uh, the Forest Service is a federal agency that works under the executive branch under uh, the Department of Agriculture. Um, and we, we really kind of have four levels of leadership within the agency, especially for national forest systems. So the Superior National Forest is within one division uh, of the Forest Service. And there's multiple things that we do as an agency. Uh, there's a research uh, branch that we have. There's a state and private forestry, state, private, and tribal forestry uh, branch that we have. Uh, we also have international programs where we help other countries. But when you think of the Forest Service, at least domestically, you really think of the forests mm -hmm. that we have out on the landscape. And sometimes that get con gets confused with the Park Service or state forestry agencies. Um, and so those four levels that we have, we kind of have the Washington office, and that's that interface with Congress, uh, that high policy level. And then it's subdivided, and this is really kind of span of control, the, the country is divided uh, into nine regions. And we are in the eastern region. So uh, Minnesota to Missouri to Maryland to Maine is the eastern region. There are 17 national forests and grasslands that occur uh, in the eastern region, the Superior National Forest being the biggest uh, and most contiguous of those forests in the eastern region. Um, we're pretty unique in the eastern region. A lot of the other forests that occur here uh, were actually acquired through the Weeks Act. And so those were other lands that were privately held that over time were acquired, um, neglected, um, run down, needed to be restored. And so they were acquired uh, to become other national forests. The Superior National Forest uh, was actually a reserved land um, and has been within the federal uh, ownership um, over time. And so we're a lot more contiguous. We're a really large forest, uh, 3.2 million acres, uh, a mil 1.1 of those being the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness. Sure. So very unique in this landscape uh, for what the, the forest is. And so the forest is sort of that, that third tier. And then that fourth tier is a, a district level. So the Superior National Forest is divided into five districts. And so I have five district rangers, um, four of which um, have the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness. And then we sort of have a southern district, the Laurentian District, um, which is sort of that southern piece of, of the forest. 
Um, so my role within as a forest supervisor is really the management of the forest, of the Superior National Forest. And so everybody that works on the forest, um, the five district rangers that manage those five districts, the staff officers, so the different program areas, sort of that span of control, we're very uh, military, militaristic in the design. So paramilitary design of we have staff and line positions. Um, and so I have staff and um, about five staff officers and five district rangers that work for me that help in the administration and um, policy of the forest. So if you think of complicated projects that occur or decisions that need to be made, um, though that is my job of the direction that we're going, the strategies that we take, uh, and the actions that we ult ultimately implement on the landscape. You mentioned earlier about fire and uh, learning a lot about that relationship of fire with a wilderness area. And I know that's a big part of managing a national forest is, is dealing with fire in a, in a reactive and in a proactive way. Can you talk about that? What the Forest Service role is regarding fire? Yeah, so most landscapes, um, national forest system lands, uh, occur on landscapes that have adapted to fire. Um, we reside in a boreal forest ecosystem, uh, which is ultimately a fire adapted ecosystem. Um, it's sort of a stand replacing ecosystem every 100 to 300 years, a very large fire uh, will come through and reset that ecosystem uh, to burn. Obviously, human interaction um, with these ecosystems uh, has influenced that over time. And so if you think of uh, the Anishinaabe people that have been here uh, for time immemorial, right, they have influenced that ecosystem, the boreal ecosystem that the Superior National Forest occurs within. Um, and so really, when we manage fire, um, whether that's in fire suppression, reacting to fire, or doing fuels reduction or prescribed fire in a proactive way, it's really related to the people that occur on the landscape, right? So the fire would occur no matter what, and it would do the things that the ecosystem needs it to do. Um, that interface with people on that landscape's makes it more complex, right? We need to protect people's property and their lives. Um, we need to, in some cases, try to prevent it from occurring. Um, and in some cases, we need to do it in a, a time frame because we can't prevent it um, in the appropriate time that is the risk is reduced. Mm -hmm. And so um, we have lots of efforts, both in fire suppression and in uh, risk reduction projects that we do across the landscape. The Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness, um, because it is a, a, a big undeveloped area, fire does interface in that ecosystem differently than it does outside. We suppress fire, we react to fire um, slightly differently than mm -hmm. we do, both because of the legislation, the Wilderness Act, um, and what we're allowed to do in a wilderness area, and because of that boreal ecosystem and how fire potentially comes out of um, that undeveloped area into a developed area. Right. Can you talk about some of the specifics about how it's different uh, outside of the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness versus inside? Uh, yeah. Fire? So when we look at a fire inside the wilderness area, we, we really look at what is the risk? What are those values at risk? that we need to protect, right? And that mostly occurs both in the public that is interfacing, uh, that is recreating within the boundary waters and uh, those bo those uh, boundary communities mm -hmm. outside of the wilderness area. And what is the potential that that fire is going to impact those values at risk? And so we may fly aircraft, um, but those are exceptions to the Wilderness Act that we need to make sure that we're complying with, that we're trying to minimize that impact to wilderness mm -hmm. uh, to the extent that is appropriate, right? That's not to say that we don't use aircraft or we don't uh, insert uh, fire suppression personnel, um, but it is in a very mindful way. As opposed to fire outside of the wilderness, there is automatic responses of we need to suppress this fire for those values that occur um, that are threatened outside of um, the wilderness area. And okay. so those are a lot more prevalent outside of the wilderness than they are inside. Mm -hmm. 
Can you talk a little bit about maybe some some misconceptions of what the Forest Service is responsible for and what you're not responsible for? Yeah, um, I probably don't have an exhaustive list. Um, <laughs> and honestly, that would be great to hear from people of what are those questions or mm -hmm. what are those differences of the Forest Service versus other responsibilities? Um but some that do come to mind when you think of fire response, um, that's one of those. Uh, we work really closely with our other jurisdictional agencies. You think of uh, the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. They are also responsible for protecting private lands mm -hmm. um, in this intermixed ecosystem that we reside. Um, and so we have a close partnership um, in how we protect uh, lands that adjoin uh, the forest and how we maybe respond and provide mutual aid in those environments. So if you think of Ely specifically, or the Gunflint Trail, um, those are areas that, that really the state has the jurisdictional responsibility to protect from a fire response standpoint. Um, but we work with them to help to cover that because really it makes no difference to the public who's responding. They just want to see a firefighter coming in to protect uh, their property and that risk that it sure. poses, right? Um, and so we work at a national level Level, at a state level, at a local level, uh, to try to make those jurisdictional, those administrative things more seamless um, so that when that does occur, um, we're, we're responding appropriately. But sometimes that can get confused of why isn't the Forest Service doing what they need to do? Right. Um, sometimes we're not the responsible agency. Mm -hmm. I think other times... Um, you know, how we do vegetation management across the landscape, um, how recreation occurs across the landscape. Sometimes that can get confusing. Sometimes uh, our role as a federal agency, um, people have a perception of their personal rights. I have the right to go and do something on my private land uh, that, that I feel is the right thing to do, right? Um, sometimes there's regulations that you have to comply with. As a federal agency, we actually have authorities, right? Congress has granted us certain authorities to do actions on the landscape. And until they tell us that we can do A through Z, we're really limited to what they've already told us. And so I, as a manager, I don't have rights, right? I have authorities that I comply with. And so that can be frustrating for the general public of why don't, why don't you do the logical right thing to go out and do out on the landscape? Um, and, and sometimes we have to work through that process to get there. And, and that can feel like bureaucracy and very frustrating. Yeah both for us as managers and for the public. Um, you know, those, those can be misperceptions sometimes. And then there's the, the confusion sometime between um, what the state can do, what the adjoining lands as a trail, an OHV or a, uh, an OSV uh, trail, you know, whether that's during the summer with your ATV or during the winter um, with your snowmobile, you know, those trails that go across different jurisdictions, go across different lands, um, those can get confusing sometimes when those rules change. And so that's also work that we do at the Superior National Forest to try to minimize those differences that you see across the landscape. Yeah, I imagine there can be a lot of confusion and some frustration with the general public when it comes to, as you said, what people presume to be their rights on the land and, and how that fits in with what you're authorized and expected to do in terms of managing those areas. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, there's definitely public outcry that um, we try to uh, be open and transparent, try to be engaged with the public and answer questions as they occur. Uh, definitely during my tenure, uh, the year and plus that I've been here, uh, we've started to hold open houses at least once a year at each of our districts and at our supervisor's office to really be open to answering those questions and to addressing those concerns that people have. Um, but also, we've really started to move towards collaborative efforts um, where we've 
started to move towards standing up a collaborative related to management of the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness. Um, you know, that's kind of a change of trying to be open of hearing a broad range of stakeholders um, to come and have a conversation together so that we have that that perspective of, you know, what are the issues? What are those things that need to be addressed? And how can we um, hear maybe those divergent points of view in the same place. Um, and, you know, there's a long history on this forest of engaging local communities, uh, engaging those d diverse perspectives, but in one on one conversations. And so trying to have that in a collaborative forum um, where we can be open to trying to find a path forward in somewhat contentious issues sometimes. Yeah, and I know just that that public information piece is really crucial, uh, especially when I think back to a couple of years ago, 2021, we had some pretty big fires happening on the forest, the Greenwood fire to the south of Ely, and then uh, another fire that was actually burning in the uh, Quetico uh, area on the Canadian side. And it was one of the driest summers on record, and there was a lot of tension, a, a lot of just fear sure. um, among among the people that live in the area. And and the thing that struck me with the Forest Service response to that not only not not even to mention the the volume of personnel and equipment that's involved in in managing these fires, and as you said, protecting life and property, but the dissemination of information and the regular meetings, the regular press releases, and the public forums that allowed people the opportunity to to ask questions and get clarification. I was I was very impressed with that response because again, so many moving pieces, just the idea of managing all the personnel and the equipment to control the fire, but then to manage the interface with the public. It, it just seems a very Herculean task. Sure. Yeah, well, unfortunately, the, the Forest Service as an agency has had a lot of practice yeah. uh, at this, not just here, but nationwide. And if you think of the fires out west in California over the last decade, um, you know, we have been working under the incident command system as mm -hmm. an agency with our other federal partners, with the state partners uh, for decades really now. And so all of those lessons learned over time have really helped us to be more proficient, uh, better engaged when those emergencies happen. And we do have a system that we tap into um, nationwide to help support in those worst case scenarios. Yeah. And unfortunately, this year with El Nino uh, weather pattern setting up, um, we're already experiencing uh, a drier winter, those sorts of things um, that, you know, as I said, this is a fire adapted ecosystem. Uh, it's just a matter of time. And so uh, with drier dries, um, there's potential that, that fire can occur more frequently across that landscape. And so that is something that we're very mindful of, um, that we're always preparing for um, and, and trying to be proactive as possible um, in those fuels reduction projects and those community engagements before the emergency happens, because that's when we're going to be most successful when the emergency actually happens right. um, to react to it. Yeah. And again, kudos to you and everyone that's involved with those efforts of fire management and just communicating with the public, which is so crucial to help people feel like there's someone listening to them about their concerns in, in the area that they live. Yeah. Appreciate that. Yeah. So let's talk, we talked about your career with the Forest Service, your 20 some year career with the Forest Service. And of course, growing up in a, in a Forest Service family definitely helps. But can you talk about some of the career, some of the jobs that are involved in uh, the U.S. Forest Service and, and in particular on the Superior National Forest? Yeah, so uh, it's a broad range of careers uh, that that potentially could occur within the Forest Service as an agency, uh, all the way from leadership positions uh, that interface with Congress on a regular basis. We have people that testify before Congress as the chief and deputy chief positions, high level leadership, um, all the way down to uh, people that are out out on the landscape, actually cruising timber and uh, interfacing with the public and helping them to recreate. Um, we have historians that uh, 
work for the agency, wildlife biologists, uh, hydrologists and engineers. Um, so really almost any career that you might think of, um, there is something within the forest service that probably does that some position that, that does that job. Um, here on the Superior National Forest, we have a broad range of program areas that, that we have that do work here on the forest. And so as I sort of talked about, we have five district rangers and I have what I call five staff officers. And there's multiple program areas that work under each of those positions, both at the district level and at the forest level. And so uh, we have engineers, uh, we have administrative professionals, uh, we have people that interface with at the front desk and that customer service of selling permits um, and providing information. Uh, we have wildlife biologists and botanists and fisheries biologists. Uh, we have foresters that uh, work in both timber. So you think of the forest or the timber products industries, um, whether that's lumber or siding or biomass um, sorts of products. We have people that interface to help those sales go to that uh, timber industry. We have civiculturists that are out there designing the prescriptions um, and um, planting new trees out on the landscape. We also have uh, firefighters, um, and you know that is becoming more and more important uh, as we support the nation. Um, fire uh, fighters that fight fire here, and then support um, you know the rest of the country when they need us. I think that's a, a broad range. There's many other positions that I'm sure that I'm missing, but uh, some that are definitely on my mind at this point. Yeah. And in terms of managing the the forest here in the area, I think it's important to remember that there's also uh, that the Forest Service also provides a lot of jobs for the region. Yeah. So I think we have a little over 300 positions that we uh, have here on the Superior National Forest. Um, so that that's a pretty big employer in this region. Um, and then, like I said, there's 17 national forests uh, in the eastern region. There's nine regions across the country. So I think there's about uh, 35,000 people that work for the Forest Service overall. Wow. Excellent. So one final thing that I wanted to touch on, and this is of uh, great interest to those who guide and recreate in the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness, uh, coming up later this month, the uh, Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness permits go live. Can yeah. you talk a little bit about that process? Yeah, so as it does every year, uh, or at least for the last few years, um, through rec.gov, uh, go live occurs. And so all of the quota permits um, are available on that day for people to start to um, make their plans and reserve those permits so that they can enter into the Boundary Waters uh, throughout the summer season. And so that's through May through September that that quota permit season is for. So uh, at this point, everybody that has an interest in traveling in the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness or camping or guiding is starting to plan out. They're looking at the routes that they want to travel, the entry points they want to use, and their first choice, their second choice, their third choice. And it's a little bit like the Wild West when those, when those permits go live. Yeah. So uh, being proactive, having a plan, understanding where it is that you want to go. There's lots of information that we have on our website uh, to, for people to do that research to help them understand when those permits are available. Um, and yeah, it is a very competitive process. There are a lot of people that are very interested in going to the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness. And the reason that we do have a permit system is to try to limit that overall impact that too many people out on that landscape at any one time would have Absolutely. Um, in a very beautiful place, uh, really what we think of as a crown, crown jewel within the Forest Service system. Yeah, and I think anyone who's spent any amount of time in the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness can appreciate the fact that you don't experience, generally you don't experience too many people. You don't experience a glut of people or just that that overuse of the area. And I think that is one of those things that really makes it special. Yeah, I appreciate that. That is definitely what uh, we are managing for, that wilderness experience. And the website again? Uh, rec.gov. Excellent. 
Well, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Tom Hall is the forest supervisor with Superior National Forest joining us here on our very first episode of the Forest North podcast. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. Thank you so much, and we'll talk to you again soon. All right, bye. Welcome back to the Forest North podcast. I'm your host, Brett Ross, and I am joined now by Steve Robertson, Interpretation and Education Specialist with Superior National Forest. Hello, Steve. Hi, Brett. Thanks so much for being here. Good to be here. Uh, Now, to get started, this is our first episode of the Forest North podcast. If you could just tell us a little bit about your background and and how you came to be... uh, Uh, in your position on the Superior National Forest? Well, I am a long-term Minnesota resident uh, since like third grade, but uh, I started out down in the Twin Cities area, grew up down there around the the Twin Cities, Um, worked for a variety of different parks down in the Twin Cities area as an interpretive naturalist, worked for the state parks briefly, and then my wife's a wildlife biologist with the Forest Service, and her job carried us up to Alaska. So we got to spend about six years up in Alaska, um, had the great joy of working at a bear observatory up there and got up close and personal with some some brown bears. Um, and then after we had had enough of the rainforest and everything in existence was moldy or covered with moss, um, we decided to move back down to Minnesota. And so we came back down here and uh, stayed with the Forest Service, which meant that we stayed up here. And frankly, this was, I think this was as close as we wanted to get back to the Twin Cities. <laughs> It is. I can imagine after being in Alaska for six years, it's tough to go back to uh, an urban environment. For it, sure. it is. And, and we spent quite a number of days on the first couple of years looking out on Lake Superior and waiting for the tide to go up and down. And, you know, it, it just doesn't <laughs> it just do doesn't, that. No, no, it doesn't. Strange. No whales either. It's <laughs> kind of disappointing. <laughs> it's quite the uh, inland sea we've got here in our region. Oh, it, it definitely. Honestly, it looks more like the ocean than the place we were in Alaska. Alaska, really? where we were on the ocean. Yeah, okay. we were we were deep inside of the uh, archipelago that's down there in, in southeast Alaska, and so we looked out on islands. Oh wow! And so you could go out in, you know, relatively small boats and go fishing for salmon and halibut and stuff like that on the ocean, and it didn't seem very much like the ocean. Wow! I'm much more scared to go out on Lake Superior to tell you the truth. <laughs> Some big water. Yes. I know people who sail out there and it always it just amazes me that they sail across that kind of open water, but uh, it's pretty spectacular. So tell me what uh, an interpretation and education specialist does with the Superior National Forest. I'm primarily involved with outreach to different people, um, kind of part of the public face of the Forest Service. We're interested in education. That part of it involves going to schools during the school year and uh, going into classrooms. We'll get calls from teachers saying things like, oh, we're reading Julie of the Wolves or something in class, and so we'll be asked to come in and talk about animals related to that. Um, During the non-school year, I supervise a couple of naturalists who do naturalist programs at campfires at resorts up and down along the North Shore. Uh, It's a way that we have an audience and they have some basically entertainment for their guests. It's been a really good public-private partnership since the 1980s. Uh, They help pay for those two positions, and so it's worked out very well. Um, The interpretation part, interpretation is a name that was hung on this business Oh, a long time ago by a guy named uh, Tilden, who was with the National Park Service, who basically the National Parks asked him to go out and look and see what their people were actually doing. Hmm. And he came back and said, they're interpreting things. (laughs) They are taking nature that people doesn't don't understand and changing it into a language that people do understand. Okay. So it's the exact same thing as changing. I have a niece who's a Spanish language interpreter and it's the same thing she's doing. She's changing Spanish into English and English into Spanish. And my job is to change the natural world into something which maybe a business person from the twin cities area can relate to. Sure. 
So that that's kind of what the interpretation aspect is. And so we try to make it so that the forest is approachable to everybody. Um, we're more inclusive and we end up getting a, a diverse audience of people who can come up and enjoy the forest because we really like to broadcast the fact this is this is public land that's owned right. by everybody in the United States. Right. We always ask, you know, kids in some of our classes, it's like, who do you think owns the national forest? And, you know, they're like, the government, <laughs> nobody. And and the answer is no, all of you guys do. Yeah. You, you paid for it in April 15th. It, right. it was, it, it's your land. So right. that, that's a cool aspect of it. Yeah. What an amazing resource that we have uh, here with our, our national forest lands. And uh, especially here in northeastern Minnesota on the Superior National Forest, uh, it, it's just, it's a seemingly endless wilderness here in our region. And uh, so much wildlife and forest and, and waterways. Uh, we're just, we're very fortunate, I think, to have uh, the national forest lands that we have here. And of course, now we're in the kind of the heart of winter time and uh, a lot of animals tend to uh, hibernate, kind of sort of go to sleep for the bulk of the winter. Can you talk a little bit about some of the animals that we don't necessarily see on the forest in the wintertime, but are still very much around? Yeah, there's a, there's different techniques used by animals basically to survive the winter. Winter's hard. I mean, it, it, it is for people as well. And some people use the same kind of techniques, I think, as animals do. Uh, <laughs> one of them is migrate south. So we have sure. lots of different critters that leave. If you've got wings, that's something that's fairly easy to do. It's a lot less easy to do if you're a small animal. Mm -hmm. So small animals and and some large animals, but things that can't fly are kind of stuck here. Uh, strangely enough, actually, there's a fair number of Mm, about half of our bat species migrate south. Okay. And people don't think about bats necessarily being migratory, but some of them do. Mm -hmm. um, so if you are here, you have kind of an option of try to stay active, stay warm, find food. And a lot of animals pursue that route. Uh, tree squirrels, gray squirrels, and red squirrels, they're going to be active all winter long. But other animals decide that the way to go is hibernate. Uh, hibernation is different than a deep sleep. If you or I go to sleep, our body temperature doesn't drop. We maintain our same metabolism. We may not be conscious. We may be dreaming, but our metabolism basically stays the same. We're still burning the same amount of energy. A uh, hibernating animal, on the other hand, they actually turn down their whole metabolic process. So they're burning fewer calories. They drop their body temperature and it's a way to survive without, without basically eating mm -hmm. or needing to eat the whole winter. And we have several different species who are, who are true hibernators here on the forest. Um, all the way from bears, which you'll get into a big debate with biologists about, are they hibernators or do they just go into what they call estivation or torpor? And right now, the the bulk of the, the scientific literature seems to say they're actually true hibernators. They do drop their body temperature down. They do turn down their, their metabolic rate. Um, they just don't drop as far as, say, like a ground squirrel. Okay. Um, ground squirrels, they drop their body temperature down to the ambient temperature. It okay. goes all the way down, so they're the same temperature as their surroundings. Wow. Bears, they're just so big and so furry that it's hard for them to actually drop their temperature that far. But they kind of are trying, in a sense. Okay. Um, other ones that you might not think about as much as hibernating would be tree frogs. Oh. Uh, they're kind of a cool critter because, well, cool in, in many ways. They, they drop their temperature down to ambient temperature and they're on trees. So they basically freeze. They, they turn into a, a frog sickle through most of the winter and uh, they, they pretty much freeze like a popsicle. Wow. Um, the trick is, is to freeze like a popsicle. So it's sort of a soft freeze instead of hard, like an ice cube. So they'll survive that way. Um, morning cloak butterflies, people don't think necessarily about insects, but butterflies will hibernate through the winter. Morning cloaks are some of the first ones seen in the spring, and that's because they overwinter as hibernating adults. I took apart a, a sign at one of our ski trailheads um, a couple of years ago now in the fall, and we were replacing it with a new signboard. And I opened it up, and there were, I'll bet you, 
two or three dozen morning cook butterflies behind it. Really? That all had their wings folded and they were hibernating for the winter. And wow. I felt really bad because yeah. I didn't mean to have disturbed yeah, them. Yeah, sorry. I, I, I put the sign back up, actually. Sure. Um, but, but they'll end up also dropping all the way down to ambient temperature. Um, little things like Arctic ground squirrels who we don't have around here, they're, they're one of the, the real... Um, heroes of, of the hibernation world they, they drop their body temperature down they go below freezing which is kind of amazing for a mammal and then they did some really cool studies where they actually come back out of hibernation but not all the way to being awake and it appears that what they need to do during the middle of winter is not eat or sleep or defecate it they dream Really? That, that, that they show their, their, their brain waves show that they're in a dream state and then they go back down into deep hibernation. Wow. And why, I, I mean, who knows what an Arctic squirrel dreams of? Just dream um, of squirrel stuff. Squirrel stuff. <laughs> but, but our local squirrels, um, chipmunks will hibernate. Um, they also rouse a couple of times during the winter to eat. Uh, most critters, when you're talking about like bears, uh, they may rouse a little bit in the winter. Uh, it's January. The, the mom bears are given birth around in January. It's debatable whether or not they wake up entirely for, for birth. Um, but they may rouse enough to know what's going on. Some of the animals will rouse enough to eat. Um, but almost very few of them rouse enough to, to end up going to the bathroom, which is, I think, also an amazing feat. Right. Uh, one of the funny things to do in the spring is, I don't know if you've ever hiked around, but you can actually find bear plugs that are uh, the first poops that bears have in the spring, and they're this big, solid, massive <laughs> stuff that they ate in the fall, and they basically <laughs> eat it to stuff themselves up yeah. during the winter. Wow. Um, bees? You don't mm -hmm. think about bees, but, sure. but they hibernate as well. And they're one that on warm days, if you have a beehive, they'll actually take flights out six inches or so away from the hive. Really? Just to defecate. Really? <laughs> and you'll see the snow around the beehive. And it's one of those things that you don't think about bees even right. doing. <laughs> Very interesting. Yeah, I never would have thought of that. Yeah. So, so hibernation is a really cool thing. Um, bats are hibernating bats you're probably aware of they're in they have a problem uh they're on the verge of being or they already are considered endangered species due to white nose syndrome right a fungal disease that they catch in the hibernaculum in the places that they're hibernating so the migratory bats they don't have to worry about that but little brown bats um northern long-eared myotis uh Eastern pipistrel, well, I guess it's now the tricolored bat, um, big brown bats. They're all of the hibernating ones in Minnesota, and they have they have real problems. Um, but in the past, and actually now too, the the, the ones that are, that are surviving, the way that they hibernate is they pack on what's called brown fat. That's a really high energy fat. Mm -hmm. uh, they store it in their body, and it allows them to rouse again in the in the spring and it's just this high energy fat that sustains them through the winter and then they basically have enough to be able to wake up in the spring okay uh one trouble and why we ask people not to do things like caving and things during the winter is that you can rouse the bats and they just don't have enough fat stored to wake up very many times okay so if you wake them up more than a few times they'll come spring and they won't have the power to wake they up again. might not wake up for good yeah. in the springtime yep and they think that that's part of the problem maybe with white nose syndrome is it okay. just disturbs them enough that they they keep rousing during the during the winter and then okay. they just don't get the wake-up call in the spring very interesting and of course uh, i have a f very strong fondness for bats uh every time i swat a mosquito i, I appreciate the bats around here <laughs> I, I, doing their part i love bats I, I got to way back in grad school work on a, a group that was banding bats and, and okay. we were in a in a cave putting bands on bats and I just love their attitude. There, yeah. It's this little tiny guy and he'd be looking up at you and baring his teeth and going, I'm going to kill you. And you're, like, you're like, no, you aren't. You're about the size of my thumb. Come on. But, but I just kind of like their, their kind of pugnacious attitude yeah. is, is fun. Yeah. So uh, talk to me about turtles. I'm very curious about what turtles do in the wintertime. 
Turtles are, are unique. I, well, maybe not unique, but they've learned a lot more about them recently. I know when I was in grade school and until recently, what I'd been telling people is that turtles go down to the bottom of the lake and bury themselves in the mud and sleep through the winter. Uh, they do have the ability to um, take water in, well, basically through the rear end, um, and actually they can pull oxygen out of the water so that they're, they're breathing through their butts during, yeah. during part of the winter. No kidding. Yeah. Uh, but now they've found by radio tagging some turtles in, in Minnesota, this was a study done here, they were able to, to track what the turtles were doing during the winter because they could go out on the ice with an antenna and they could radio use the radio tags to find where the turtles were. And they found out they're actually wandering all over the bottom of the lake. Really? And they were congregating in certain areas. So even though they maybe would have gone into the lake in one place, they would wander like a half a mile or something to another spot on the lake where all these other turtles were gathering up. And so there was kind of a big turtle party going on at the bottom of the lake. All in relatively slow motion because yeah. they're turtles right? and because they're in cold water. So they're not exactly going at high speed, but there still was sort of the, these congregations of turtles down in the lake during the winter that were quite active and nobody had ever really known that before. Yeah. So that's, that's pretty spectacular. Yeah. But they do. So they are technically a, an animal that hibernates. They will be hibernating through part of the time from okay. what I understand. And these, these turtle uh, ramblings during the lake are, are just during parts of the winter. Okay. So fascinating. Yeah. It's amazing to think about what goes on under the ice in the winter time. And, and the fact that, you know, the, the water under the ice is actually warmer typically than the uh, ambient air temperature. Yeah. Close to the winter. Yep. If you're a person who ever does saunas, um, jumping through a hole in the ice is a whole lot warmer than, than doing a face down snow angel oh, sure. um, <laughs> because the snow is going to be minus 20 degrees or whatever the actual temperature right. of the air is. If it's liquid water below the ice, can't be any colder than 32 degrees. Right. So it's going to be warmer than, than the snow is. And so down underneath there, you've got this whole different environment going on where you're lacking a light because you've got snow on top of the lake. So there isn't a lot of photosynthesis going on with the, with the water plants. Right. But the fish are still moving around some. They're eating some, but not very much. Everything's kind of slowed down, but it still is, is life happening. You don't, you don't have the hibernation kind of things maybe that are going on on land because it's a little bit warmer in a sense. Sure, sure. You mentioned uh, offline some things about trees. I know we notice with the non-coniferous trees, obviously they lose their leaves in the fall, but pine trees retain their needles and they still seem to retain that sort of activity throughout the year. Yeah. Uh, I, I guess working for a national forest, I, I'm somewhat obligated to talk about trees at least some of the time. <laughs> sure. Yeah. And There's a lot of them. One of my favorite things that, that I do as part of my job is I, I write a fall color report weekly during the, the fall season. And I take a lot of fall color photography that we put on our Flickr site and on the web. And people have this great appreciation for deciduous trees, trees that lose their leaves. Mm -hmm. They do a kind of amazing thing when you think about the, the acres of, of surface area on, on trees and to lose all of that. Yeah. I mean, you, you spent all this work growing leaves during the spring and during the summer, and then you just drop all of it. It is pretty radical. Right. Uh, they do manage to pull a lot of the nutrients back out of the leaves, which is part of the reason they change color. Uh, and then hopefully the leaves are going to rot once they get on the ground. And so they'll be able to recirculate that back through, but it still is a lot of work. And up here where it's cold and you have a long winter, it starts to be almost too much work for, for the tree. We're, we're on the 
northern edge kind of where where deciduous forests are really starting to peter out a little bit uh, the maples don't go much farther north than this birches and aspen will go farther north but about on the northern edge of, of sugar maple range and what really comes in instead are all the conifers mm -hmm. and so we've got all of these needle leaf trees and part of the reason that they do better in this area is they're better adapted to our long winters and cold weather they can continue to do photosynthesis in the winter so they got green leaves they're actually actively making sugars and stuff during the winter that your maple tree that's lost all its leaves it's doing nothing right. it, it's sitting around waiting for spring <laughs> but the conifers are still working uh and they've got a couple of good tricks on that to begin with the needles people might think you know it, what are needles for maybe they're to keep deer from browsing and they kind of help with that but the main thing is is that they have less surface area so they're going to be losing less moisture they've got a waxy coating which is what makes them stiff and prickly and that helps hold the moisture in as well and during the winter it's not just cold and dark but it's really dry all the water is frozen it's tied up it it's basically a desert out there during the winter really and the conifers are really built to be able to retain moisture they also shed snow uh, softwoods compared to a hardwood like a maple the branches bend if you end up with a snow covered conifer you've seen them sometimes during the winter they look like an umbrella that's folded up all of the all the branches bend down once the snow falls off tree pops back up it's not damaged by it something like a maple if it had held on to its leaves and that much snow fell on it you'd end up with the branches breaking mm -hmm. off so they're really built to deal with that kind of thing and then last if you're going to be alive in the winter you have to have sap and fluids running around inside of yourself if you're a tree and so you've got conifers that have resins and some other um, metabolites called terpenes that are in their in their sap that help act as natural antifreezes so that that sap can continue to move without actually freezing solid you'll see the maples like on some of the areas where there, there's a good sugar maple stand up here they're oftentimes very contorted because they have a lot of frost cracks in them where sap has frozen inside of the tree and broken it apart mm -hmm. and that's part of the reason we're on the northern edge of the range is that, that they just have too much to contend with but something like a, a conifer their sap just doesn't freeze very easily because oh. it's antifreeze protected yeah, I was just speaking with someone the other day about uh, they were actually they work for a tree service or own a tree service and were taking down a very large maple tree here in Ely. And it's good to have an understanding of the fact that the sap that remains in the trees can freeze and cause cracks. Right. And, and the cracks, one of the main problems with the, with the crack is that they let diseases in. Right. And so you'll end up with uh, some kind of a, a fungus rot or something will get into the heartwood through the crack. And then you'll start to get the tree hollowed out from the inside. Right. So even though it looks like a, a wonderfully healthy tree on the outside, you start realizing that the inside half of it is, you know, carpenter ants or or right. or just rotten wood and there isn't that much holding the tree up right which is you know hard for us humans if it falls on our house yeah it, it's wonderful if you're like an owl or a oh, sure. or a pileated woodpecker looking for a nest hole for sure but those trees when they're going to be a hazard by somebody's house or we'll take down hazard trees and campgrounds and things like that too where it looks like it's going to fall over on top of a a campsite or where yeah. it could cause a hazard. Well, some very interesting information and good interpretation of what's going on in our uh, wilderness area here. It, it's always fun to talk about. I mean, there, there's always something happening outside. I mean, it can be middle of January here yeah. and you'd think there's nothing going on, but there's there's always something interesting out there. Fantastic. Thanks so much for filling us in today. And we look forward to you joining us on future episodes of the Forest North podcast. Like you said, always something going on, even in the in the deep heart of the frozen winter here in the Northland, there's still a lot going on out there in the forest. All right. Thanks. Good to talk to you. Thank you so much. Steve Robertson, interpretation and education specialist with the Superior National Forest. We'll talk to you again soon. Thanks.
Thanks for listening to Forest North. And a big thanks to my guests, Superior National Forest Supervisor Tom Hall and Interpretation and Education Specialist Steve Robertson. Forest North is created by the Ely Tourism Bureau in partnership with the USDA Forest Service Superior National Forest. Find more information about the Superior National Forest at fs.usda.gov superior. And remember to like, follow, subscribe, leave a five-star review wherever you're listening, and email your feedback or questions to tourism at ely.org. Stay tuned for episode two as we talk in depth about Go Live Day for Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness Permits coming up on January 31st. Thanks so much again for listening. I'm Brett Ross. I'll talk with you next time on Forest North.